Hello friends, welcome to Dungeons & Dragonfly, where I adapt various characters for use in d and I'm Dragonfly9078, and today I'll be building Aang, the titular Avatar and Last Airbender from Avatar The Last Airbender. For a bit of background, Aang was born as an air nomad, a culture of spiritual monks who had the ability to manipulate air and wind. That's not all Aang can manipulate though, because he happens to also be the Avatar, the only person in the world who can manipulate all four elements. Unfortunately, he got bullied for being the most powerful person in the world, and when the world needed him most, he vanished. He woke up a hundred years later having been frozen in an iceberg, and sets out with his new friends to master the four elements, defeat the Fire Lord, and end the Hundred Year War. So what do we want from this build? Well, first of all, Aang is a monk, and for once I'm not talking about the class. I mean an actual air nomad monk, with all the spirituality, not eating meat, and semi-pacifism that that entails. Next, we'll need all four types of bending, so we can prove we're the Avatar and not just some kid in a costume. And finally, in addition to bending all four elements, the Avatar has access to their past lives and is able to both access their wisdom and channel their power in the Avatar state. Looking over at ability scores, we'll be using the standard point array from the player's handbook. If you want to roll for stats, that's fine, just make sure that your dexterity and wisdom are at least 13 for multiclassing. We'll start off by dumping strength. Aang is at most 13 by the end of the show, and he's pretty scrawny. Dexterity will be 15 though, he's so light on his feet he can fly, and it probably takes a fair bit of constitution to survive being frozen for 100 years, so we'll make that a 12. Intelligence is 10, again, he's just a goofy kid, and skipping a full century probably doesn't do much for your history checks, but we'll put our 14 into wisdom, because he's got some pretty good advice, even if most of it does start with and finally, our 13 goes into Charisma, because if you're going to end a world war that's been going on for 100 years, you need to be able to talk to people. Aang is a human, but slightly better, so go with Variant Human for plus 1 to 2 ability scores, a free skill, and a free feat. Bound off Dexterity and Charisma with your two free points, so we don't have any odd ability scores. Take Animal Handling to be great at that. And take the Mobile feat for some air-powered running abilities. Our speed increases by 10 feet, we ignore difficult terrain when we dash, and if we attack an enemy, we don't provoke opportunity attacks from them for the rest of the turn. Since Aang was raised in a temple, we'll take the Acolyte background for proficiency in religion and insight. Hopefully we remember enough about our culture to rebuild it from the ground up, since we kind of need to. I said I wasn't talking about the monk class earlier, but I am now, because Aang is one of the monkiest monks to ever monk. We get two skills from the monk list. Acolyte gave us our spiritual training, so take acrobatics and athletics for our physical training. We also don't like to wear armor heavier than our orange jumpsuit, because that interferes with our martial arts. While unarmored, we can use dexterity instead of strength for the attack and damage rolls of our unarmed strikes and monk weapons, we can make an unarmed strike as a bonus action after attacking with an unarmed strike or monk weapon, and our unarmed strikes and monk weapons can use a d6 for their damage. Quarterstaffs are great monk weapons, and we're pretty great with ours, so again, don't wear armor. We don't even need the armor, really, because we have unarmored defense, making our AC 10 plus our dexterity plus our wisdom, and unarmored movement increasing our speed by 15 feet. Neither one works while we wear armor, so again, don't, definitely don't wear any. Monks get a pool of key points to do monk things with. We get one point for each of our monk levels, and they refill on any rest. Since we're at least 6 level, our key also empowers our unarmed strikes, making them count as magical. Step of the Wind uses one key to dash as a bonus action and double our jump distance for the turn, which pairs nicely with our mobile feet. Patient Defense uses one key to dodge as a bonus action, and Flurry of Blows uses one to make two unarmed strikes with our bonus action after attacking with unarmed strikes or a monk weapon. With Deflect Missiles, we don't have to worry as much about projectiles, since we can use our reaction to reduce the damage of one by a d10 plus our dexterity modifier plus our monk level. Then, if the damage is reduced to zero, we can spend a key point to yeet it back as a monk weapon. I did always wonder how those archers caught Aang, since he blew away their first arrows with wind and then proceeded to not do that again the entire rest of the time they were chasing him, but I guess he does only get one reaction in a round, so it is what it is. Aang is a monk who can bend the four elements, so of course we're going to use the four elements monk. All four elements monks get elemental attunement, letting them create minor sensory effects or reshape a foot of earth, fire, water, or mist within 30 feet. They can also cool down food if it's too hot, which is a thing Aang actually did in the show. We'll also take Fist of Unbroken Air, using two key points to force a strength save on a creature within 30 feet, dealing 3d10 bludgeoning damage, pushing the creature back 20 feet, and knocking them prone if they fail. 
when we get another elemental discipline at 6th level, go with Water Whip, since that's an actual technique in the show. It's kind of like the inverse of Fist of Unbroken Air. We use two key points to force a dexterity save on a creature within 30 feet, dealing 3d10 bludgeoning damage and either knocking it prone or pulling it 25 feet towards us on a fail. For both of them, the creature takes half damage and isn't moved or knocked prone if they succeed on the save, and both can deal an extra d10 of damage for each additional key point we spend when we use them. It would be nice to get all the way to 11th level so we could use our key points to cast Fly, but we're multiclassing before then, so we'll have to content ourselves with Slow Fall, reducing our falling damage by 5 tartans our monk level. At 4th level, we get our first ability score improvement, so take the Magic Initiate feat for some more elemental goodness. We get two cantrips and one first level spell off any spell list. Take Gust, Shape Water, and Shield off the Sorcerer list. Gust makes a small wind that can shove a creature 5 feet or an object 10 feet. Shape Water lets us move, freeze, or shape a 5-foot cube of water, and Shield uses our reaction to increase our AC by 5 for the rest of the turn. I mostly took this because I really wanted Shield, because it's something Aang uses a lot, and our second class actually doesn't have it on their spell list. 5th level monks get extra attack to attack twice using the attack action, and Stunning Strike using a key point to force a constitution save on a creature we hit with a melee attack, stunning them on a failure. We can use Evasion to take no damage on dexterity saves that we pass, good for dealing with angry spirits or hot-headed teenagers, and Stillness of Mind to center ourselves, removing an effect of charming or frightening so we don't get our face stolen. For the rest of the build, we're going to jump over to Druid. Druids don't wear metal, and I'm comfortable extending that respect for nature to not eating meat, especially since we don't need leather to make non-metal armor thanks to our unarmored defense. They also learn Druidic, a secret language known only by Druids. Our culture died out over a century ago, so we're probably the only one left who speaks the language. The main draw of Druid, though, is Wild Shape, the ability to turn into an animal twice per rest. But Aang doesn't do that, and we'll be using our Wild Shapes for something else, so let's talk about the Circle of Stars instead. With the Circle of Stars, we get a star map that we can use to cast the Guidance Cantrip, or to cast Guiding Bolt without using a spell slot a number of times per day, equal to our proficiency bonus. Guiding Bolt shoots a laser that makes whatever it hits easier for other people to hit. Is that because it takes away their bending and leaves them powerless? Who can say? But probably not. We really came here to glow it up in the Avatar state with starry form, though. As a bonus action, we can expend one of our uses of Wild Shape to take on a luminous form for up to 10 minutes, with glowing lines going along our limbs, shedding bright light for 10 feet and dim light for another 10. When we do, we choose one of three constellations to give us power, since we're at least 10th level, each of the constellations is enhanced, and we can switch to another one at the start of our turn. The Archer lets us shoot a laser at a creature within 60 feet every turn, dealing 2d8 plus our Wisdom modifier Radiant damage, and the Chalice lets us or a creature within 30 feet of us heal 2d8 plus our Wisdom modifier whenever we cast a spell that heals a creature. But really, we want to use the Dragon. While the Dragon is active, the Wisdom of past avatars flows through us, making it so we can't roll lower than a 10, on any intelligence or wisdom checks or concentration saves that we make. We also get a 20-foot flying speed and can hover in place. Add in our mobile feet and unarmored movement, and that turns into a 45-foot flying speed. Finally, we can consult the past avatars for a cosmic omen. At the end of a long rest, we roll a die and get a special reaction based on the result. If the die is even, we can use our reaction to add a d6 to an attack, ability check, or save that a creature within 30 feet of us makes. And if it's odd, we can do the opposite and subtract a d6. Even or odd, we can use the reaction a number of times per day equal to our proficiency bonus. For our three ability score improvements from Druid, we're going to go nice and simple and bump our constitution higher to take hits better, our dexterity higher to be dodgier, and our wisdom for better AC and spell save DCs. Speaking of, looking over at spell casting, we are a 13th level caster, meaning we have access to 7th level spells. Druid is great for Aang because Druids get all the fun elemental spells. Air spells tend to be very good at moving creatures around the battlefield. They often push creatures around if they fail saves, and several can make them spend extra movement to fight against the wind to get where they want to go. They're also good at enhancing our own mobility, with speed boosts, jumping boosts, and flight, though most of them don't do much in the way of damage. Windwalk is my best approximation of Appa for this build, giving you and up to 10 other creatures a 300-foot fly speed for up to 8 hours by turning you into clouds. The only actions you can take are the dash action and turning back into your normal form, which takes a full minute, so it isn't good for combat, but as overland transport, it's extremely useful. 
Water spells are also good for battlefield control. Several of them can knock creatures prone or impede visibility, and there tends to be a bit more potential for damage than air spells. Sleet Storm, in particular, combines just about every hindering battlefield condition into one spell, heavily obscuring a 40-foot radius cylinder with freezing rain that extinguishes flames and covers the ground with ice, making it difficult to rain. Whenever a creature starts its turn in the area or moves into the area for the first time on a turn, they have to make a dexterity save or fall prone, and just being in the area forces creatures to make concentration saves every turn if they're concentrating on a spell. Earth spells tend to be defensive or utilitarian, with just as many uses out of combat as in combat. Hold Person traps someone in stone, and both Stone Skin and Investiture of Stone create Aang's stone armor, with Investiture also letting him shake the ground to knock enemies prone. Bones of the Earth is a druid exclusive spell that is pretty classic earthbending, making up to six 30-foot tall pillars of stone burst from the ground, creating obstacles or lifting up other creatures. You could use this to reach a new area, give an archer a safe vantage point, or even slam enemies against a ceiling. Fire spells are mostly good for straight up dealing damage, with our one attack cantrip being produce flame, flaming sphere creating a controllable fireball, and fire storm for an enormous fire blast. On the defensive end, we can use fire shield to resist the cold and absorb elements to redirect lightning. For spells that aren't tied to our bending, we can use find familiar to summon a flying monkey to be our friend augury and divination to consult our past lives for advice, plane shift to visit the spirit world, and locate animals or plants for that technique that Aang used to find Appa in the swamp. It does kind of make you wonder why he didn't use that when Appa was kidnapped in the desert, though. Now that the build is complete, the question becomes, how good is it? Well, holy shit are you versatile. Your spells can do practically everything you could ever need them to. From damage to battlefield control to non-combat utility like water breathing and overland travel, and with the dragon constellation active, it's really hard to make you lose concentration. You're also incredibly mobile, with a 55-foot walking speed, better jumping, and multiple ways to fly, one of which doesn't even use a spell. You can get where you need to be when you need to be there. And you're decent at skill checks. Not being able to roll lower than a 10 on any intelligence or wisdom checks is huge, and your cosmic omens can help as well. On the other hand, your strength is bad, and the Dragon Constellation doesn't help with intelligence saves, so you could fall prey to a feeble mind. You're also not great at combat without your bending. Even with your martial arts, your melee attacks only deal 1d6 plus 4 damage. And finally, you're working with very limited resources. Druids only get 2 wild shapes per rest, but normally the length of time they can be transformed goes up with the druid's level. Circle of the Stars doesn't have that. Your starry form can only last 10 minutes per use meaning you only get 20 minutes of avatar state between rests, not even mentioning your limited key points. But honestly, that's all you should really need. Even without the avatar state, Aang is an immensely talented bender, and he has his friends to help him out. Stick together, watch each other's backs, and who knows, you might just save the world. I hope you enjoyed the build. If you have any feedback or suggestions for characters you'd like to see me build, please leave them in the comments below. Thank you for watching, friends. I will see y'all later.